Amen. Well done. Thank you very much. And he is always enough. Amen. When we let him be. Good to see you this morning. Been fighting uh, strep throat and all that other crud that goes along with it. So we're going <coughs> to cough through my message a little bit this morning. Please forgive me. I'll be sucking on a cough lozenge. If I drop over and look like I'm dying, please somebody come up and give me the Heimlich real quick. That means I swallowed my lodges. You got me covered there, all right. No, I don't know How about you. You might break me in half. So. <laughs> Maybe Joseph, you ain't a problem, you? But <laughs> you work out more often. <laughs> hey, what a great day, though. We got to a great service at Magnolia today. It was, uh, had baptismal service there as well. The difference between the Magnolia campus and the Believer's Fellowship campus of spring is the baptistry here is heated. <laughs> so I'm wide awake. After crawling in that thing, we had to break the ice on it to get it. Uh, but uh, praise the Lord, there were only two. So uh, it's one of those days you're glad you only baptized one or two. I prefer baptizing more than that, but uh, th I was thankful today. Amen. But uh, we knocked the ice off, got the sermon preached, and uh, are here today to continue in our series of messages that we've been, we've been preaching out of the Word, uh, dealing with the, the Lord's second coming, back to the future. In fact, today is part 10 in that series. We're dealing with the great white throne of judgment. This is uh, not much happier message than the one we preached last week when we talked about the tribulation. These are not necessarily those uh, happy, positive messages, but they're truth. And we need truth. We don't need somebody to come and just always be giving us happy, positive messages. We need the balance of, uh, of God's Word in every aspect of it. Now, there is some great, great news from this message today, and there's a lot of shouting you can do because it does talk about the eternal essence of where we'll spend uh, our eternity with God in heaven and the beauty of, of that. But prior to that, as we, we've been going through this, this simple chart each week and kind of breaking down different aspect, aspects of it each week, during the whole series we began with the, uh, of Jesus' departure where the angels are looking in the heaven with the disciples and says, this same Jesus whom you've seen will come again in like manner. And so that was that parting words. But that prophecy had been given by Jesus himself. The apostles continue prophesying that. Prophets of the Old Testament not only prophesied concerning the first coming of Jesus, they also gave us great insights into the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus himself taught, and we preached about three or four messages from Matthew 24, where he's going through the signs in global affairs. He's talking about signs in religion. He's talking about the famines and the earthquake and the pestilence and the wars and racial division, national division. He deals with all that. In Matthew 24, and then he deals in chapter 24, verse 32, with the, that one sign that really, I, I guess, all great theologians and scholars and prophets and Bible study people have been looking for that would really be the, the key indicator that the Lord's return was soon. Although we don't know the day, Jesus said you can know the seasons. And what would be the beginning of that season would be what Jesus referred to as the budding of the fig tree. So just talking about the nation of Israel its impact upon prophecy, what the, the, the establishment of the nation of Israel meant to end times and how that, that's the key indicator which so many have looked for for centuries to be that the big sign which says Jesus coming is very soon. Jesus said, hey, my coming's at the door when you see that sign. My coming's very near. And so we understand just realizing that if, if the scriptures are true, which I believe they are, and we're very clear, very near the end of um, time as we know it and humanity as we know it and we're in into an, an incredible time and where Jesus is going to come and manifest himself on the planet the next event we talked about after you see these wars and famines in Israel and all that happened would be the 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 rapture of the church we call it this that taking away is that's a that's a Latin word that word rapture is not in the in the Bible it's referred to as the taking away or the blessed hope or the glorification of the saints all those refer to a time when the Lord will appear in the air and receive the dead in Christ as well as those who are living and know Jesus at the same time into heaven with him. Now that, that's that time where the Bible says, you know, that, hey, we're going to become new creations, that this old man's going to, this old, we already are new creations internally, but externally as well as internally, we're going to be sanctified and made clean and made new and glorified bodies as Jesus had after the resurrection. The Bible said we'll be caught up with him. Now, shortly during that time, we talked about following that would be the, 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 a seven-year peace treaty that would be signed by someone we call the Antichrist, the man of peace the world referred to, the false prince Daniel called him. But when he comes, he will 
apparently the world's in absolute chaos after, after this taking away of the church. You can imagine the chaos that would per, uh, ensue, <coughs> excuse me, ensue after a time like that. But he comes into a time of great chaos and introduces a peace in the Middle East, which people have been trying to do for centuries. He comes, but it's a false peace. In the middle of that, that peace treaty during the tribulation, he declares himself that he is God, requires that everybody on the planet get the, his mark, the 666 mark in hand or forehead. If you want to buy, sell, do trade, do business, have a job, you, then you have to conform to what he's doing. If you resist it, then you're, you face the global citizen's court and the penalty is death. If you become a Christian, reject the, to receive the mark of the beast at that time, the penalty is death and beheading. So we've talked about those events as well. And if you haven't been with us, all this has been, I think pretty much we're caught up within a sermon or two and it's on our Facebook channel, our YouTube channel. You can go back and catch up on some of these messages there. But during this time, uh, this tribulation that, that it's, that's on the earth, at the end of the tribulation, we dealt with that last Sunday, all those events in the tribulation all end with the glorious return, the second coming of Jesus Christ. The blessed hope, the rapture, that's not the second coming. We call this the apocalypse or the revelation. That, seems, that means the same thing. It means the uncovering, the unveiling. All of a sudden, men are going to see Christ. They're going to understand that he is the king of glory and that he's the Lord of lords. Now, the cover is going to be pulled back and it's going to be revealed that he is the ultimate answer to all men's sin. He comes destroys the Antichrist and his armies of the world who resist God, reject God. There's a judgment that takes place at the Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon we call it, which is the judgment upon the nations. Then he begins a 1,000 year reign on the planet. At the end of that 1,000 years, Satan is loose for a short time. Then it's all wrapped up. He's placed in the lake of fire for eternity. And at this time also is another final event before we step into the future ages of the presence of God for all eternity. He's, we step into a time where the scripture is referred to and, and as, as, the, as the day or the judgment day or the great white throne of judgment. It's a time when all men living and dead are brought before the Father and before the Son and they're judged there before God. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. It says, Then I saw a great white throne uh, and him who sat, seated on it Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as were recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in to the lake of fire. Now what you're dealing with here is the final event where men are going to understand very clearly some, some, some obvious truths that God has been seeking to make man know all through time and history. They're going to understand that God is God, that he is a just God, he's a righteous God, and they're going to be... I believe, have revealed to them the grace of God that was manifested to them in so many ways and how so often they rejected that precious grace that God had given and made affordable to them. At this final judgment, as all final judgment, you're going to discover whether it's the works of the Christians that were rewarded at, we refer to the Bema Seat or the judgment seat of Christ, or the works of the unsaved, all those things are in view here. Now what happens, let's back up a little bit. Remember before the tribulation, we talked about the saints are caught into heaven. We're just not setting up there on clouds as we talked about last week. There's a season of great praise. If you look in the book of Revelation, there's multitudes of people around the throne of God worshiping and praising him. There, there's, there's this event we call the, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that's not the great white throne of judgment that we're talking about today. I did a series of messages in the past on the judgment seat of Christ and the, and the crowns and the rewards from the judgment seat of Christ. But it deals with a time where believers, those who truly know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they stand before him and their lives are revealed to them and they are rewarded. It's a place of reward or they lose rewards. We're, we'll all be standing there, all of us who know Jesus, our names will be called and we'll receive rewards or we're going to lose rewards. In other words, the Bible indicates that there's rewards for all of us, but only those Christians who are faithful 
and serve the Lord with their life and honor the Lord with their life, will they be blessed with these crowns or these rewards? At the great white throne of judgment, works are also in, in view there as well. But what we're going to discover, the question is who is saved is not determined before God at that moment, but it was determined back about their life on the earth and what they did with their life on the earth. What is revealed here at the great white throne of judgment is the confirmation of their destiny by the means of what God has recorded in these books that are there. In other words, nobody's going to stand at the white, great white throne of judgment and say, oh, yeah, okay, we're looking at the books. Okay, you're saved, you're not saved. All right? These books, plural, that are open are going to be examined and they're going to be open and their determination of heaven or hell is not anything to do with it. It's a determination they're going to see that God was right in making the judgment that he made and the sentence that he imposed because the truth will be revealed about each person's life that is there. Now, if you read through that passage with me one more time, you'd discover that there's, there's books and there's, there's book. There's two different sets here. There's the books, plural, all right? And it's a set of books that are there. And the Bible talks about them in a the plural sense. And then it mentions another book, which is singular, all right? Now, the most important thing that we want to understand today is, is my name written in the book singular? Because everybody's name's in the books. But there's another book over here. And if your name's not in that book, well, you're in trouble. So let's, let's look at this, 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 what he's trying to tell us in the book of Revelation. First of all, remember the unsaved are gathered there and they're all before God. From the, from, they've been raised up from the dead from all over time and history and they all stand before God and they're judged according to this library of books, all right, plural, that are being read from. Everything is there, you know. All, it's all revealed. They're judged according to how they live their life. They're judged according to their works. And it's kind of like the library of works, the library of what they did. All they've ever done has been recorded in these books. It's all there. Every mistake, every action, every good deed, every bad deed, everything is in, in these books, all right? When you look at it, there's a little bit of a paradox here because we're being judged on the basis of what's written in these, in these books about our works. But understand, works don't save anybody, all right? Works don't save us. And this has been the, the, the long recurring argument of the ages. You know, people say, well, I'm a good person, so I'll be saved. I'll go to heaven and not go to hell because, you know, I helped a little old lady across the street or I gave money to, to some philanthropic organization and helped out with humanitarian needs or I, I built a, a home for somebody. Works don't save anybody. There's one message that comes clear from Genesis all the way to the Revelation and is that the only way people get into heaven is by the grace of God. And that God has performed a, a, a demonstration of his grace by sending his own son. The Bible says no man is saved, we're all sinners, and no one is saved by works because, but then it goes on to tell you that they'll just be boasting. The, the works always lead to an arrogant attitude. But we're all saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 make it very clear that salvation comes through knowing Jesus. Verse 10, all right, you just read through grace. But verse 10 says, hey, but if we are saved, then we will live a life that honors the Lord and there will be works that follow. It says that we are saved unto good works. It doesn't say we're saved by good works. It says we're saved by grace, but we're saved unto good works. In other words, that once we meet Jesus Christ, something changes, our life changes, and now we want to glorify God with our life. So these good works are a result and the fruit of our lives that are committed to Jesus Christ that all our works are recorded. Now, these are what we might call, you know, uh, these are the book of works. Every bad thing is there. Every good deed is there. Every sin, every injustice, everything I did that was wrong, all the activity of my life that was wrong, every secret sin, everything done in the dark as well as done in the light, every good deed, every moral deed, every religious deed, my whole life is there. Your whole life is in these books, all right? And it shows ultimately that God is just, that there's no place in that books, plural, that if you receive Jesus, there's no place, you know, that if you didn't receive Jesus, there's, there's any hope for salvation. And you're going to see, it's going to be a settlement of that, that, that sad truth, that, that truth that most people believe all their life, that, well, I just have to wait to heaven. And when I get to heaven, I'll see if I'm saved, if I was good enough. 
Nobody's good enough. Why? Because we've all been stained. We're born sinners. All right? All, everybody that's ever been born since Adam was born a sinner. It's our nature, all right? So here we stand before God at this great white throne, and here's the book of works that are open, all right? And I said there's a sad truth. Here's what it is. Even though all these works are listed there, everything is there for you to look at, everything is there for you to see, none of it really has any bearing on your salvation. Only thing that bears on your salvation is what's in that book over here, this singular book that's there. That's the one you have to look at to see if you're saved or not. That's the one that, that, that's important. What's written in that singular book, if it's not there, it's important. Revelation 20 says this. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So catch this with me. If you read through this chapter again, you have books, plural. You have a book, singular. All right? You have book, you have books. The book, singular, is the Lamb's book of life. It says in Revelation 21... Nothing impure will enter in. Talking about heaven. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That singular, most important book of all books. Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? That's the deal. And it only gets pinned in there by one, by one means and by one method. It happens the day you give your heart in faith to Jesus Christ. And the books are there to prove that no matter what the works were, good or bad, none of that can save you, set you free, you know? You have to make a decision that's based upon the truth of God's word. And the truth is that Jesus is the way of salvation. Now, we're reading, as you read through this chapter, as all these people are brought forth from death and Hades and Sheol and all these, all, all these people are brought before God and they're all standing there before the Lord. And you say, well, well why are all the people present? And, and as well as both sets of books, the, the book and, and the book's pearl. Let me say that this, this point right here. First of all, the unsaved, those who don't know Jesus Christ, that whose names aren't in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will be judged according to perfect records, all right? Sometimes our record ability is not really good. We have a tendency to remember only the good stuff we do. We forget about all the foul things we said and all the foul things we did, amen? Can I get a witness? All right, let's get a little quiet in here. We have a tendency to remember just how good we are and pat ourselves on the back. We have a tendency to forget and have some kind of spiritual amnesia when it comes to about gossip and lying and all the other elements of the sinful nature. But God's books, these books that are right here at the great white throne of judgment, these books are in perfect order. There's no chance for bias. There's no chance for prejudice. There's no chance for lying. And every sinner that's been born in the planet is going to have to acknowledge the, these books are in true and in fact that, that they're right. And they will confess and acknowledge their sins and the things that are written in those books. They'll, they'll have to agree with everything there. Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he's talking about the trouble they're going to face. He said, don't be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed that's not going to be disclosed or nothing hidden that will not be made known. What's he saying? There's going to come a day, gentlemen, you need to understand the lid's going to come off this deal. And we're going to see who's who and who's real and who's not. The skeletons are going to fall out of the closet. You know, the past issues of life, you know, the adulteries, the immoralities, the fornications, the theft, everything hidden is going to be known. Now, here's good news. If you know Christ, you don't have to sweat this. Why? Because all your sins have been blotted out. All your sins have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Your sins have already been judged, paid for at the cross of Jesus Christ. He took it all upon himself. But here we start seeing the sin exposed in men's heart. And it's the sins not only that were external, it's the sins of the heart, you know. I mean, human courts and human judges can't adequately make judgments that are based on, on, on actual, complete, 100% truth because they can't look into a person's heart. But God does. God knows the motives of everybody's heart. He sees our hearts. And the Bible tells us they are put down in the proper place in the book of records. God sees our hatred. He sees it as murder. God sees our lust. He sees the adultery and the fornication. He sees our deception. He sees our lying. He sees our stealing. He sees the outward show. How often did Jesus rebuke the Pharisees, those religious men who had a really good outward coat, but on the inside it says they were full of dead men's bones. They, they, were, they were displeasing to God. They were unjust men, but they put on a good show and they look good on the outside. But God sees past all that and all that's in the books that are mentioned here. So all the people are present and the unsaved are the ones who are being judged according to what is in these books. Another reason that everybody's there to witness and to be present is the records are opened up 
as I believe that every, there, will be, there will be every witness to the records that are that present. In other words, if there's a wrong done to someone, that person is going to be present. Listen to what Jesus, even speaking to the, to the people of his own generation, he made a reference back to the time of Jonah. In Matthew, he says, The men of Nineveh will rise in judgment with this generation and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. What's he saying? He's saying, you have to realize that when everybody stands before God, nobody's going to be saying, well, that's not a liar, that's not true, that's not, no. There'll be witnesses to what God is saying as well. They will, they will rise up, he says, and they will, they will condemn you. They will, they will tell you, hey, you had the opportunity to repent. You say, I never had an opportunity to repent. You will see all the opportunities you had to repent and didn't. You may have covered them up as something else. You may have said it's just a guilty conscience. You might have said it was just a, some kind of issue going in your life, but no. He said, you know, you had the opportunity to give your life to God and to give your life to Christ, and you did not do it. They'll bear witnesses about the chances that you had, and you didn't take the chances that you had. The third reason all these people are present, all right, at, at, at this judgment, I believe at, at, this judgment will be given in, they're going to see that judgment will come I believe in lesser degree or in greater degrees based upon what these books say. In other words, I believe that hell will be more hell for some people than it is for others. And Jesus gives us the insight to this when he says in Matthew 23, he says, Woe unto you, talk to the religious phonies, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayer, therefore you shall receive a greater damnation. Those are powerful words. When he talks about a greater, he talks, he's dealing in, in the, the language that was written in the Greek language, means there'll be a greater part. It will be a greater portion. There'll be, a, there'll be a, a greater lot assigned to you in regard to this. The measure of what you're going to suffer will be greater than what the measure that others will suffer. Remember what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy, talking about Alexander the coppersmith, what he did to me, he did much evil to me, and the Lord will reward him according to his works. You're going to pay in a greater measure. James warns, warns the church in the New Testament. James tells us it's important that if you're going to say you believe and say that you're a believer, that you live what you say. Especially if you're going to rise to the occasion to be a leader within the body of Christ or a teacher in the body of Christ. Pay close attention to this, guys, that are in leadership around here. But if you're on this stage on any part, or if you're in before a classroom, or you're in this pulpit, you listen to what he's saying. He said, James said, listen, guys, brethren, don't be many masters knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. And it meets the greater judgment. We're going to be held to a higher standard here. Now, we're all held to the same standard, ultimately. But if you're going to assume that place of leadership in the kingdom and in God's church and in God's work, you need to realize God's going to hold your feet to the fire on this deal. You can't be getting up telling everybody what they shouldn't do and be doing it yourself. You can't tell everybody how they're supposed to live their life and not live your life in the same manner. Now, people, you know, think about that for a moment. There's never a place where I quit being preacher in my life because of the role I've assumed. Never a place where I quit being teacher because of the role I've assumed. If I'm going to lead worship, if I'm going to, I really believe it has to do with any area of ministry that we're holding. God holds us to a high standard. Hey, if you're going to stand before people, people need somebody to follow and they need a righteous standard to live by. So you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but you need to live like, like you believe you've been called and you need to live a life that honors God because people are looking at you. I mean, how many of you, you know, completed high school? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you completed college? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand either. Some of you hadn't got out of Sunday school yet. But. <laughs> Amen. but how many of you can remember everything they taught you in the classroom? Nobody here. All right. But how many remember, remember those teachers that made a difference in your life? And you live as that teacher who truly committed, truly cared, truly honored, truly loved. That was that teacher, wasn't it? That was that person that influenced you. Somebody who really did, really believed what they said. And I'm sure you believe that's true, not only in a religious sense in the world, but also in so many other areas of our life. Those are the people who make the difference. Those are people who mean what they say and say what they mean. And it comes to the Christian life. Hey, this is a responsibility we have to realize that is ours because we're judged by another standard. It's God's children. And to be a leader and to be, to be in charge or to be ahead of anything means you have to realize the accountability you have before God. 
again, why are all these people present? Let me give you the fourth reason everybody's present for these judgments, all right? Because it resolves for all time. We're just saved by grace only and not of works. The biggest argument for the ages to this day is, uh, are you going to heaven? Yeah, I think I'm going to heaven. Why do you think you're going to heaven? Well, because I'm a good guy. Isn't that the major argument most of the people you talk to? Well, I hope I'm going to heaven. Well, I've been a good mother. I've been a good dad. I've tried to be a good person. You know, the Bible makes it very clear. Again, from the beginning to the end, nobody say because they're a good person. They may be good in a moral sense before the world, but we're all sinners before God because God is so righteous and so holy, we don't even come near. And what we discover with these books being opened is these people may have worked very hard in their life and may have done a lot of good religious stuff even, but that's not what saves a person. There's only one way. We're going to discover that the Bible teaches there's only one way to be saved, and that's by grace. The biggest debate through the ages is, does grace save or not, or do my works save me? The Bible teaches it's salvation by grace only. All right? It's by grace only. Let me give you three quick truths about that. One, the Bible makes it clear. Salvation is only by grace. There's no other way. It's grace plus nothing. It's not grace plus baptism, grace plus works, grace plus, you know, uh, church membership. It's just grace. You get saved by grace. All right? That's the doorway. It's, 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 it's through faith in Jesus Christ. John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. You know what the rest of that says? No man comes to the Father but by me. So there's only one way to salvation. Acts 4 says, the apostles say, there's no other name under, uh, among men whereby a man must be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. First, uh, Timothy, he's telling Timothy, Paul is, there's only one mediator, only one way to get to God, only one person between God and man, and that's his son, Jesus Christ. First John 5 says, he that hath the son hath life. This is gonna be settled right here at the great white throne. All of humanity is gonna see there's only one way. God's word is right, God's word is just, and I rejected it. The second thing I want to show you about this is the Bible teaches that when a person does give his life to Jesus Christ, that works do follow that. When we get saved, we become a new person. Our nature is changed, and the Holy Spirit now resides in us. And there's a desire to want to live for Jesus that comes along with salvation. All right, It's the Holy Spirit himself living in us. And I want to be used by God. I want, I want to glorify God in my life. I want to make a difference. I, I, want, I, I want to walk with God. I want to know God. So the Holy Spirit, you know, he's working in us, and as he works in us and through us, the fruit of the Spirit flows out of our life, and that's the difference we make in other people's lives and for the glory of God and the kingdom. The third truth is the Bible teaches that works before salvation, it just calls them dead works according to Hebrews 9. He says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from dead works. What is dead works? Dead works are the things that we think will save us. There's only one work. It's the work of grace that Jesus did on the cross. That's the only thing that saves us. Well, Brother Joe, I'm a Mason. Well, good for you. But are you a Christian? Well, Brother Joe, I'm a Baptist. Marvelous. The jails are full of them. But are you a Christian? <laughs> you know? Brother Joe, I, I, I speak in tongues. Great. But do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Was there ever a time in your life you put your faith in your tongues? You put your faith in Jesus? Well, Brother Joe, I, I saw a light. That doesn't mean anything. Maybe it was Jesus. Great. But that doesn't mean that saved you. There has to be a place in your life where you put your faith in Jesus. Then salvation comes. Well, Brother Joe, I've tried to be a good person. That's marvelous. We should all try to be a good person. Well, you know, when Jesus, when the, when the word of God comes, and it's a word like this written to the Hebrews, the Hebrews were people who were prone to, you know, to, the, to, to a system of works and the law. But God's word made it clear that the law was never intended to save anybody. It was sent as a tutor, as a teacher, to show us we can't keep the law. Good as we might try to be, we fell over and over again. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie. Anybody here kept that? No, we've all lied. Some point in time. We broke the very first commandment. We just refused to let God be our God. We won't be our own God. So the law was given to show us that we fall short and that we need a Savior and we need somebody because we can't do this ourselves. So they had this system, but so many took it wrong. They said, well, I have this system of law. I'll keep those laws and that'll save me. Uh, church, and, Christ, church members aren't any much different. I go to Sunday school, I go to lift group, I do this, I do that, I sing in the choir, I do this, I preach a sermon, therefore I'm saved. You know, I told somebody about Jesus, therefore I'm a Christian, I read my Bible, I visited, you know, for Jesus, and, and it goes on and on, the list does. But anybody that sits back and tells you, how do you know you're Christians? Well, I'm a deacon. That should give pause right there. Or my granddad was a great preacher. You know? Or I, I, I teach Sunday school. That doesn't save you. That doesn't make you fit for heaven. All right? In fact, if you don't know Jesus, it's not fit for nothing. 
It calls it here dead works. So we want to look at this, and I think one thing that the judgment shows in this great white throne judgment, hey, it's just dead works unless you know Jesus. Let me wrap all this up. We'll just call this, you know, the drama of the books and the book. The book's plural, the book singular. If your name is in the book, this is the first scene of this whole thing. All you whose name is in the book of life, it's not going to be the long list of all the sins. You've already been judged for your works and, and your crowns and stuff. It's going to be, hey, uh, Joe Arms, senior. <laughs> I can only count for myself. <laughs> hey, come on in, into the joy of the Lord for all eternity. You're in. Wow, because there was a day you gave your life to Christ. You weren't trusting your works. All right? Your name's in the Lamb's book of life. Your name's been pinned in here. It's indelible ink. Can't be washed out. Can't be penciled off. Can't be scratched out. It's in there. Your name's in the book. So if your name's in, in, in that book, you're all right. But what about if your name's not in that book? Well, I believe the first scene is like this. First scene is you have all these, uh, when it gets to the judgment of the books, you have all these pagans who embrace their paganism and embrace their ungodly. I mean, you're talking about the guys like, you know, we just talk about Fidel Castro dying, others who want to praise Castro. He was a heinous, heinous murderer, you know? He's a wicked man. And then you talk about, you know, the Thomas Paines and the atheist past, and Madeline Murray O'Hare and her anti-God movement and get God out of the schools and get God out of the courtrooms and all those people. You know, you got your Stalins and your Hitlers and that whole crowd's going to be brought before God. And I believe they're going to receive a greater damnation. I believe hell is going to be really hot and really hell for those guys because we're all judged according to works. And boy, they can't say a whole lot about their works there, can you? The second scene that broadens forth it when we're talking about the books, plural, is, the, is, is it's not the drama of the evil. It's the scene of what I call the religious. In Matthew, Jesus said, Now everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many will say to me in that day, that's the day we're talking about, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in thy name we've cast out devils. In thy name we've done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. This is, this is powerful. These are religious people. These are people that go to church. These are people that help. These are people involved in ministries. Some are casting out demons. But look what it is. He said, I don't know you. Well, where, what did I miss? You missed knowing Jesus. You missed by substituting religiosity for, rela uh, uh, for relationship. You, you passed the relationship and you went straight to religion. Christianity is not about religiosity. Christianity is about knowing God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Christianity is about having your sins forgiven and welcomed into the family of God. You can be religious after that, all right, in the righteous way and serve the Lord. Because good works should follow. But there's a lot of people who bypass that. I can't tell you after 16 years of, of traveling ministry and itinerant evangelism, how many people in ministry got saved in our revivals and our crusades. I mean, it, I, I can start naming them off right now. How many people? I, I, I mean, I've seen youth pastors. I've seen pastors. I've seen deacons. I've seen women's ministry leaders come to Jesus Christ who came in that, that time when the revival was breaking out and God is moving and the Spirit's working, they would come forward and they'd all say something like this, I've tried to be a very good person in my life thinking that would save me. I really have. I kind of always felt I, I, wasn't, I was a sinner, but I'm not that bad a sinner. And I thought that maybe what I should do is just be a better person. The Bible doesn't preach, that's not the gospel. The gospel is you can't be a good enough person. The gospel is somebody had to die in your place. And hallelujah, somebody did. You know? Somebody took your place. And in fact, you couldn't even take your own place because the sacrifice, according to Scripture, had to be clean and unblemished and without spot or stain. We're all blemished by sin. We couldn't even die for ourselves. That's terrible, isn't it? That's how incomplete and vile we are. But God loved us enough that I don't have to go about my little busy way, trying to do a lot of religious stuff, hoping against hope, and I stand before God, and he's going to let me in last minute. It's getting my teeth. No, we can have confidence because we trust God, and we trust his word. We have faith in Jesus Christ. We know that we know because God's done work in our life. 
So you see these, these, these Sunday school teachers, and I believe pastors and church leaders and people involved in visitation programs and hospital ministries and door-to-door -door ministries and deliverance ministries, evangelists, they're all standing before God. And they're all saying, but we did all this in your name. Now, we know there's a lot of stuff that goes on the name of Jesus that's cults, right? And when you agree, there's a lot of cults that go in the name of Jesus. But I don't think he's talking about that. I believe he's talking about religious people in the church. Jesus prophesied multiple times about people who would, who would just look like the real thing but wouldn't be the real thing. He talked about the difference between wheat and weed, right? He called it wheat and tear. It looks like wheat, but it's not wheat. He said, but don't worry about it. I'll separate it at the end. In other words, it's not my job to go in here and pull people out and say, well, you're tearing, you're wheat. Well, you're wheat, you so. I don't separate the crowd. God does all that. And he will do it at the end. People. These are people that were somebody, but they were missing someone. The most important one. One old preacher said they had starched and iron, but they'd never been washed. <laughs> washed by the blood of the Lamb. They were conformed, but they weren't transformed. They were professing salvation, but they were not possessing salvation. They were reformed in their actions, but they'd never been reborn. Titus, Paul's writing to Titus, and he said, listen, you're going to discover that there are people who profess that they know God, but in their lifestyle and their works, they really deny Him. They're disobedient, and they're reprobate. They're void of judgment. The worst thing you can do is replace Jesus and your relationship with Jesus with religiosity. It's about a relationship with Jesus. Can you go back to a time right now in your mind? You say, there was a time when I had a confrontation with Jesus. Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. Man, I, I, I knew I wasn't right. I knew I wasn't right with God. God showed me I wasn't right with him. And I realized I'm lost. I don't have any hope. I need to give my life to Jesus in my despair, my recognition. And you can do this when you're six years old. You can do it when you're 60 years old. You can do it when you're 106 years old for your life. But there has to be this conviction, this work of God in your spirit where you say, yes, Lord, I agree with you. I'm a sinner. I'm lost, and I need you as my Savior. And as much as you knew how, you responded in faith to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, what happens, a lot of people, they start feeling bad, and natural man in his natural mind, instead of repenting, saying, Lord, I can't do anything about this. I have to trust you to save me. He says, I'm going to try to be a better person. I mean, I, I did that multiple times before I gave my life to Jesus. You know, I, I'm going to quit smoking so much dope. That'll help. I'm going to quit drinking so much booze. I'm going to quit partying. I'm going to get, you know, I, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to date a nice girl. That doesn't change anybody. It doesn't save anybody. That's the foolishness of man when he omits God from his life. It's only the grace of God that saves us. So you have this scene here with all these religious people. The last scene is this. It's the tragic damnation that takes place, this tragic judgment. It says, I don't know you. And it says, then they are cast into the lake of fire. That's it. It's over. Now, let me just say, if the books were opened in this room today, if this were the great white throne, all right, what would it reveal? If the books were open, what if the book was open? Does it reveal your name? Chapter 20, verse 13 said, in order for the wicked dead to be judged, the sea and death and Hades will give up their death. See, the, the sea represents in the death and Hades and Sheol is called in the Old Testament. That refers to, a, to, a, to an eternal state that shouldn't be confused with hell. It's more like a holding place. It's not purgatory. All right, because Catholicism believes that you can come out of purgatory by prayer and by people praying on your behalf and by giving good gifts and things like that and other people's religious works that maybe they can get you out. You don't have to go to hell. There's no place in Scripture for that. I think what's happened is they confuse places like this. Hell is getting ready to be opened up. And death and Hades and Sheol are going to deliver their dead before God, and God's going to deliver them to that place of burning fire, as the Scripture refers to it. So hell is the eternal abode. There's this temporary kind of spiritual abode right now. But the day will come when everybody's going to be brought before God and he's going to, they're going to hear their final determination, which has already been determined if their name is not written in the book. How do you get your name in the book? It's who you know. <laughs> in this case, it's who you know. And I'm just going to be a name dropper, Jesus. 
I know Jesus. Who do you know? Who you know? If you know Christ, you don't live with fear anymore. You don't live with doubts. You know, has there ever been that time in your life? You say, Brother Joe, I, I think there has been. That's like me saying, well, I think I'm married. I know I'm married. I, I know I'm married, all right? I, I don't, no question in my mind, I know I'm married. I remember the day I got married. Now, there's been a few times in my life, and I haven't remembered the date perfectly. <laughs> I have a good excuse for that usually. Was it the 10th? Was it May 11th? See, there's some other things that happen those days in my family, so I have a little, you know, I'm a little slow anyway. But you know what? I can look clearly in my mind right now, and I'm standing in North Shore Baptist Church, the northeast side of Houston over there. And it's a little church, probably the auditorium, about a third the size of this auditorium. And I'm standing there with my, my best man in the ugliest tuxedo you ever saw. I don't even put our wedding book out in public places. Not because I'm ashamed of my, my marriage. I'm ashamed of that stupid-looking tuxedo. And I don't remember who talked me into that deal. Hey, it was, this, it was the 70s. <laughs> and I'm standing there, and the pastor says, all rise, and they chime in with that marriage song. And I see her come through that, the doors at the back. My knees are knocking I'm sweating, you know. I'm getting ready to make the biggest commitment of my life, second biggest commitment of my life. Because it's forever, at least till death, goes this part. And she walks down that aisle. I don't remember a lot what that pastor said. I was so engulfed in the moment. I remember her and looking at her and saying, I do, and she did too. Praise God for that. What are you saying, Joe? There's, when you come to Christ, it's like getting married. A new relationship begins. You're not the same anymore. If any man's in Christ, he becomes a new creation. That day, I was changed. Both days, the day I got married, I was changed. No longer was I that one. I was a, I was a dual now one. When you come to Jesus Christ, your life changes. And here's the beautiful part about this. Some of you think, well, you know, I can't really say a change in my life because I never was a bad person. You're a wicked person. You just don't see it. You're selfish, you're stingy, you always want your way, everybody else's way. You'll lie about stuff, you'll gossip, you talk about others behind their back. Don't tell me how good you are. We all know, we've all sinned. Now I got real quiet. You say amen to that. <laughs> We're not as good as we have a pretense and a pretension to be. And we all need God's grace. You just don't think you don't need because you weren't what we call a dirty sinner. They're all dirty sinners. Well, I wasn't as bad a sinner as you. Yes, you were. Yours was just a different kind. It's all sin, it's all rebellion, it's all rejection of Jesus. We all need Jesus, what I'm trying to say. And we can all experience Christ because His mercy and His grace is present today. When it comes to the book day, it won't be present. It's all settled. Because it's not what's going to happen there that determines you're saving. It's what you do here. And if today you've never given your life to Christ, what are you waiting for? The invitation has been signed and sealed and delivered with the precious blood of Jesus. God loved you so much he gave his son. God is ready to forgive you for everything. That All those things that have been written in that book already will be washed and cleansed and you'll be forgiven. You want to give account for those things more because Jesus is going to account for you. If you've not received Christ, what are you waiting for? The greatest invitation, you know, comes from God himself. It opens up in the book of Genesis when God, when Adam sins, God doesn't discard him. He said, listen, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was. He's waiting for Adam to confess it. Here I am. You have to do this thing. Here I am, Lord. I need you. That's the book of Genesis. The book of Revelation, the last chapter closes with, and the Spirit and the bride say, come. Come. Give your heart and life to Christ. Let's stand with our heads bowed today. I would encourage you, if you can't go back to a time, whether it was six,